and welcome to the January edition of According to Pete. Uh, what are we gonna talk about? Well, we're gonna talk about filters today. And I won't lie to you, I'm gonna fall short of a full description of everything involved in knowing how to design a filter. In order to have a meaningful conversation about filter design, good filter design, you have to talk about things like uh, polynomial equations and uh, pole zero plots and Laplace transform, right? A lot of you guys know this. A lot of you guys don't. I am going to give you uh, basic principles. I'm gonna define some terms. I'm gonna show you a Bode plot. I'm gonna show you how components act on a Bode plot and um, show you why you ultimately lead to a, an, an active filter design and, and how that helps. And then I'm gonna point you at places for more information because I only have 15 to 20 minutes. Let's talk about filters. Blam! Let's pretend that this is a real-time signal. This is an analog signal, and you, you're interested in some of it, but you're not interested in all of it, because look, look at how noisy that is, okay? You can apply a low-pass filter. You can apply a high-pass filter. You can apply a band-pass filter. Let's say, for example, I applied this signal to a low-pass filter. Low-pass means it's going to pass the lower frequencies, and you can determine at what point it kind of cuts off, um, and attenuate everything else, okay? So for example, if I pass this through something of a low pass filter, eh, it might look kind of like a sine wave, right? The jagged stuff, higher frequencies. The, the slower moving stuff, lower frequencies. Now, let's say you didn't want that, but you were more interested in the higher frequency stuff. You apply a high pass filter. And so what comes out might look something like, you know, like that. So this stuff is gone, and now you have the higher frequency stuff. Now let's say, nah, I don't want that high, I don't want that low, but I want something in between, and I really don't think I defined a frequency in between, but let's say it's there. And so what you would get is uh, a bandpass filter, and so you might end up with something which is completely not present in the fundamental there, but some frequency in between. This is why, you want to filter, right? Any um, repeating waveform is made up of an infinite number of harmonics, okay? It depends on the waveform. And so what you're doing with uh, filtering is you are just kind of attenuating those. So this is a Bode plot. B-O-D-E, Bode plot. What this is, is a graph of decibels over frequency. The frequency is graduated by orders of magnitude. In this case, I'm going from 10 hertz to 100 hertz to 1 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz, and it goes on. Decibels are, by their nature, orders of magnitude, okay? In this case, uh, anything to, to calculate the uh, decibel value on this, you take, you know, value one over value two, log 10 of that times 20, and you get a number. Now let's talk about um, components and how they act over frequency. And I know as we've done capacitors, we've done inductors, I've described, okay, these things do this over frequency. Well, now I'm going to plot it out. And in this case, this is going to be dB ohm. To write it bigger, dB ohm. Okay, so we're going to talk about magnitudes of impedances. Now start with a resistor. A resistor ideally is not frequency dependent. So for example, let's say a 100 ohm resistor. If you're to plug a uh, 100 into this, and this is my scale being, I got zero dB here, and I'm defining that as one ohm. So 20 dB would be an order of magnitude higher than that, so 10 ohms. 40 dB would be an order of magnitude higher than that, so 100 ohms. So a 100 ohm resistor ideally will be constant over frequency, okay? There's our resistor. A capacitor is different. It decreases its resistance as frequency increases. Inductors are just the opposite, right? So a capacitor is going to trend down over time or over, over frequency. Um, an inductor will trend up. But I'm gonna stick with just R's and C's for this because uh, typically, unless you're doing like a speaker crossover, uh, I don't see too many inductors in filter circuits. Uh, most of them are active designs now. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example here. So a capacitor, let's say you've got 
um, a one microfarad capacitor. One microfarad. Well, how do you plot that, that on a Bode plot? X sub C, which is a uh, capacitive reactance, and it's in ohms, equals, and you've seen this, this equation before, one over two pi um, F being frequency, and C being the capacitance value. For a one microfarad, if you plug in the values, you assume a value for F, okay? So let's say uh, equals one over two pi, and you have one kilohertz, and you have one microfarad, okay? And you calculate that out, and you get 159 ohms. That's where you take this number and put it in here. If your reference is one, how much, you, it's basically 159 over one, log 10 of that times 20. And it comes out to be about 44 dB. All I'm doing here, y equals mx plus b. Well, that's it. Um, so you find this spot at one kilohertz. So here's one kilohertz and 44 dB ohm, and I'm gonna estimate it right about yay. Okay, well now what? Well now you just need to know the slope of your line, right? It turns out that capacitors decline in um, their resistance, their, their capacitive reactants, at a rate of 20 dB per decade. Ooh, that's easy, right? What that means is that I can write a second point at 10 kilohertz at um, 20 dB down from there. So at 24, and I'm you know, just eyeballing this, so at 10 kilohertz will be, eh, say, about there. So what the capacitor is going to do is it's going to trend down like yay. Let's talk about a practical example. Um, let's say I've got, you know, a signal source here and I am feeding it to um, a low pass filter. It's going to look like this resistor and this capacitor to ground and there's your signal out. And this is 100 ohms and this is one microfarad. When you think in terms of frequency dependence resistance, this is really just a frequency dependent voltage divider. At really low frequencies, this is a really high resistance, right? So if you look at it in terms of a voltage divider at really low, or at really low frequencies, what you're going to see is all of the signal gets passed through and none of it gets dropped to ground by the cap, right? Because it's a high resistance. At higher frequencies, say arbitrarily higher frequencies, you're going to see everything get shunted to ground through the capacitor, right? Because of this action. Here's the transfer function. Transfer function uh, <laughs> is a Bode plot of what the resulting waveform is going to be. And I'm sure somebody will go, ah, 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 say it this way. Yeah, there's probably a dozen better ways to say it than that. What is a signal going to look like? Uh, and this is just, you know, it, it, arbitrary amplitude, doesn't even matter. What's it going to look like on the other side of that filter over frequency? Let me show you the, a little cheat. <laughs> Let's say this is no longer dB ohm. This is just dB. I'm, I'm interested in the size of the signal. So instead of this being 40 dB ohm being 100, I'm going to set my reference to 0 dB, okay? And this will be minus 20, and the line down here will be minus 40. This will be plus 20, plus 40. And this is signal amplitude, okay? Not signal power. As long as we're talking about amplitude, we can keep 20 log 10 of this. If we went to power, it would be 10 times log 10, no, but we're not, we're talking about signal amplitude. At low frequencies, really high resistance, really low resistance. So all the signal is gonna pass and you're gonna see it there, okay? So what you're gonna end up with, zero dB, it's going to follow this trend line at zero dB. And what zero dB means in this context is, it is the same as your output. You'll see this A1 over A2, that, that's a difference. So it's gonna follow this trend line until it gets to here, where the capacitor starts to become a resistance that's more in line with that resistor. What's that frequency? F sub C, which is for cutoff, equals one over two pi R C. And in this case, we've got 100 ohms and one microfarad. It will come out to be 1.59 kilohertz. Once it gets to 1.59 kilohertz, the signal is gonna to start to go down at a rate of 20 dB per decade, okay? So if you go up to, if this is like um, one volt peak to peak, 
at this, if you go up an order of magnitude, it'll be 0.1 volt peak to peak. The output is going to follow this line, right? In fact, um, this is an ideal thing. What it's actually going to do is it's going to start coming down a little bit before and right about the cutoff frequency, it will actually be minus three dB from what, from zero dB. So it's gonna be at minus three dB. 20 dB per decade, well, that's not very good, is it? You're right, it's not very good. So what can we do about that? We can add another pole to that. If you were to say uh, uh, another resistor and another cap to ground, like yay, and then take your output, you would in fact get um, a sharper roll off. So, you know, something like yay, with the cutoff frequency being there. Problem is not only does this compound, like, so now at your corner frequency, you're not minus three dB down, you're minus six dB down. And not only that, but it starts getting shallower faster. And so you kind of get this thing and that's not really a very good response. So what do you do about that? There are some things we can do about that. Don't look at that. I want to back up for a second. I said the word pull, right? Now, when we did that circuit before, just the resistor and the capacitor, this is called a pole. On the Bode plot, it is the corner frequency. The pole is at the corner frequency that I described. In that case, it was 1.59 kilohertz, okay? There's not a lot you can do with filters like this, right? We used to have an accelerometer that had some of these on the output in order to suppress clock noise that uh, the device would sometimes let out on its uh, analog output lines. Uh, and the manufacturer, I don't remember which, which part it was. We don't have it anymore, I went looking for it. They would say, okay, put, put this filter on the output just to kill the clock noise a little bit to help you when you're sampling, okay? So these things are used in practice. But um, as I showed you, the response isn't that great, right? Because ideally what you want uh, let's say, uh, you know, for any given signal, you want uh, a frequency response that is very well defined, like very, you know, sharp corner and, you know, a straight down skirt. I want everything right here and nothing out there. But that doesn't happen in the real world. I can give you something to play with. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Salin Key topology for a two pole active filter. This is a low pass. Uh, topology, and you could know it by heart, just like, oh, obviously, uh, but really, if you evaluate it at arbitrarily high and arbitrarily low frequencies, you can kind of see what it's going to do, right? So at super high frequencies, you know, you got a signal coming in here, and I don't care what that's doing just yet, but at the super high frequency, everything's going to get shunted to ground, because there's a cap right there. Check it out. At super low frequencies, uh, that's not going to come into play, and this is going to be a really huge resistance, right? And you know the gain of an op amp, because we've done this in previous videos, right, is gonna be, you know, this resistance over this resistance. And so if, if this is really big and this is small by comparison, your output is going to be large. This particular device, as you can see, has 100% negative feedback. So this has a gain of one, okay? What you put in is what you get out, or ideally what you get out, um, except for the roll off frequency. Now, as I said, this is two poles. And the cutoff frequency is defined by this, <laughs> this simple equation, uh, which is one over two pi root R1, R2, C1, C2. Gosh, that seems really simple, doesn't it? Really wiggy things can happen. If, if, if C1 equals C2 and R1 equals R2, this is a pretty straightforward circuit. When you start to muck with these two values so that they're different, you get some real wackiness. The poles become complex. You have something called a pole zero plot, okay? And it is, you know, a four quadrant plot in the, um, in the S domain, Laplace. This is the real axis, and this is like the S axis or the imaginary axis. It's not really imaginary. Boy, you see this just go downhill. <laughs> We're dying. The transfer function of this is represented by a polynomial equation in the S domain, and the roots of that polynomial equation are poles and zeros that end up on this plot, okay? And um, you'll have conjugate pole pairs over here, and everything has to happen like in the left side of the plane as far as poles are concerned, and the closer they get to the right, 
the, the right side of the plane, the more unstable this thing becomes and the more wiggy it gets. Now the transfer functions of these things can look quite dramatic, but I'm not gonna go into a huge description of this. I'm going to point you at a couple of things, okay? I should probably mention, and I failed to mention, okay, this, this is, um, a uh, low pass, right? For a high pass configuration, you basically swap the resistors and the caps for each other. And calculation of the cutoff frequency remains the same. I feel really, really badly about, um, and, and kind of irresponsible about saying, okay, here's all this cool stuff. And by the way, here's an ice pick to stick in your temple. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you, look, there's a lot you need to know if you're going to, I mean, you can you can do this and you can run through these equations. And, and, and in fact, there are um, Salon key calculators online and you can actually enter in, you know, cap values and resistor values and it will spit out what the transfer function is going to look like. And it's going to show you a pole zero plot and show you, you know, where the poles are. It's going to show you the phase plot. There's also an associated phase plot. And it's really cool because you can adjust all the values and see how it works, right? If you want to know more, like really in depth and you want to know about Laplace transform and, and pole zero and all the stuff and you want to know how to calculate it from the ground up, the first thing I would do is check out Matt Duff's Filtering 101 tutorial series on the Analog Devices YouTube channel. Pretty good stuff, and he's, he's a very knowledgeable man. I would highly recommend checking out his videos and going and tracking down one of these Salon Key calculators, and you just put it into Google, it'll pop right up, um, and playing with it and checking it out. And this is a simple circuit to build, right? I mean, that's, you know, LM358, couple of resistors, couple of caps, nothing to it. Let's say you wanted to evaluate the performance of the filter that you just Built. We sell a thing, and I've got a, 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 a SKU number here, Dev DEV11643, the X Mega X Proto Lab. We just started selling this thing recently. It's not a SparkFun product, but it's something we saw that we thought was really cool. Um, it's, it's a little device about yay big. It's got a screen on it. It operates as a, a two-channel oscilloscope. I think it's got eight inputs for logic analyzer. Um, and it does uh, frequency analysis. It'll do a sweep generator. And to get to see a transfer function, you've got to have a sweep generator and a Bode plot, and this thing will do it. Um, I don't think it'll do it in very good detail, but it should give you something. I For 50 bucks, I would probably jump on it. That's sort of my filtering primer. If you guys really want me to go in depth with it, I hope you don't, um, but I, I would actually, I used to be really good at this stuff, um, but it's been a lot of years since I've actually designed filters. Uh, but it would be fun to do, right? So if you wanted me to do this and show an example, eh, our audience would probably be steadily declining at about 20 dB per viewing. Um, but it'd be pretty cool to do. So thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. I'm afraid it might have been uh, more confusing than not. Play with filters, all right? You don't have to know all of the math just to poke around with them a little bit and see how they work. So uh, give it a shot. And if you want to see more, let me know. Put questions and stuff right uh, there in the uh, comment section. Uh, or you can email them to uh, feedback at sparkfun.com uh, with according to Pete in the subject line. Until next time, this is Pete. Well, that was dumb. Don't do that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.